some courageous persons, emboldened by the example of Landois, ventured to cite, in Gilliatt's favour, certain extenuating circumstances. A few signs of good qualities, as his sobriety, his abstinence from spirits and tobacco, and sometimes they went so far as to pass this elegant eulogium upon him. He neither smokes, drinks, chews tobacco, or takes snuff. Sobriety, however, can only count as a virtue when there are other virtues to support it. The ban of public opinion lay heavily upon Gilead. In any case, as a marcou, Gilead had it in his power to render great services. On a certain Good Friday, at midnight, a day and an hour propitious to this kind of cure, all the scrofulous people of the island, either by sudden inspiration or by concerted action, presented themselves in a crowd at the Bû de la Rue, and with pitiable sores and imploring gestures called on Gilliatt to make them clean. But he refused, and herein the people found another proof of his malevolence. CHAPTER Six: THE DUTCH SLOOP Such was the character of Gilead. The young women considered him ugly. Ugly he was not. He might perhaps have been called handsome. There was something in his profile of rude but antique grace. In repose it had some resemblance to that of a sculptured Dacian on the Trajan column. His ears were small delicate, without lobes, and of an admirable form for hearing. Between his eyes he had that proud vertical line which indicates in a man boldness and perseverance. The corners of his mouth were depressed, giving a slight expression of bitterness. His forehead had a calm and noble roundness. The clear pupils of his eyes possessed a steadfast look although troubled a little with that involuntary movement of the eyelids which fishermen contract from the glitter of the waves his laugh was boyish and pleasing no ivory could be of a finer white than his teeth but exposure to the sun had made him swarthy as a moor the ocean the tempest and the darkness cannot be braved with impunity at thirty he looked already like a man of forty-five he wore the sombre mask of the wind and the sea. The people had nicknamed him Malicious Gilead. There is an Indian fable to the effect that one day the god Brahma inquired of the spirit of power, Who is stronger than thee? And the spirit replied, Cunning. A Chinese proverb says, What could not the lion do if he was the monkey also? Gilead was neither the lion nor the monkey, but his actions gave some evidence of the truth of the Chinese proverb and of the Hindu fable. Although only of ordinary height and strength, he was enabled, so inventive and powerful was his dexterity, to lift burdens that might have taxed a giant, and to accomplish feats which would have done credit to an athlete. He had in him something of the power of the gymnast. He used, with equal address, his left hand and his right. He never carried a gun, but was often seen with his net. He spared the birds, but not the fish. Ill luck to these dumb creatures! He was an excellent swimmer. Solitude either develops the mental powers, or renders men dull and vicious. Gilead sometimes presented himself under both these aspects. At times, when his features wore that air of strange surprise already mentioned, he might have been taken for a man of mental powers scarcely superior to the savage. At other moments, an indescribable air of penetration lighted up his face. Ancient Chaldea possessed some men of this stamp. At certain times the dullness of the shepherd mind became transparent, and revealed the inspired sage. After all, he was but a poor man, uninstructed save to the extent of reading and writing. It is probable that the condition of his mind was at that limit which separates the dreamer from the thinker. The thinker wills, the dreamer is a passive instrument. Solitude sinks deeply into pure natures, and modifies them in a certain degree. They become, unconsciously, penetrated with a kind of sacred awe.
The shadow in which the mind of Gilead constantly dwelt was composed in almost equal degrees of two elements, both obscure but very different. Within himself all was ignorance and weakness, without infinity and mysterious power. By dint of frequent climbing on the rock, of escalading the rugged cliffs, of going to and fro among the islands in all weathers, of navigating any sort of craft which came to hand, of venturing night and day in difficult channels, he had become, without taking count of his other advantages, and merely in following his fancy and pleasure, a seaman of extraordinary skill. He was a born pilot. The true pilot is the man who navigates the bed of the ocean even more than its surface. The waves of the sea are an external problem, continually modified by the submarine conditions of the waters in which the vessel is making her way. To see Gilliatt guiding his craft among the reefs and shallows of the Norman archipelago, one might have fancied that he carried in his head a plan of the bottom of the sea. He was familiar with it all, and feared nothing. He was better acquainted with the boys in the channel than the cormorants who make them their resting places. The almost imperceptible differences which distinguish the four upright boys of the Creux, Aligon, the Tremy, and the Sardrette were perfectly visible and clear to him, even in misty weather. He hesitated neither at the oval, apple-headed boy of Enfray, nor at the triple iron point of the Russe, nor at the white ball of the Corbette, nor at the black ball of Long Pierre, and there was no fear of his confounding the cross of Goubeau with the sword planted in earth at La Platte, nor the hammer-shaped boy of the Barbes with the curl-shaped boy of the Moulinet. His rare skill in seamanship showed itself in a striking manner one day at Guernsey, on the occasion of one of those sea tournaments which are called regattas. The feat to be performed was to navigate alone a boat with four sails from saint Samson to the Isle of Erm at one league distance, and to bring the boat back from Erm to saint Samson to manage without assistance a boat with four sails is a feat which every fisherman is equal to and the difficulty seemed little but there was a condition which rendered it far from simple the boat to begin with was one of those large and heavy sloops of bygone times which the sailors of the last century knew by the name of dutch belly boats this ancient style of flat, pot-bellied craft, carrying on the larboard and starboard sides, in compensation for the want of a keel, two wings, which lowered themselves, sometimes the one, sometimes the other, according to the wind, may occasionally be met with still at sea. In the second place there was the return from Erm, a journey which was rendered more difficult by a heavy ballasting of stones. The conditions were to go empty, but to return loaded. The sloop was the prize of the contest. It was dedicated beforehand to the winner. This Dutch belly boat had been employed as a pilot boat. The pilot who had rigged and worked it for twenty years was the most robust of all the sailors of the channel. When he died, no one had been found capable of managing the sloop, and it was, in consequence, determined to make it the prize of the regatta. The sloop, though not decked, had some sea qualities, and was a tempting prize for a skilful sailor. Her mast was somewhat forward, which increased the motive power of her sails, besides having the advantage of not being in the way of her pilot. It was a strong-built vessel, heavy but roomy, and taking the open sea well, in fact a good serviceable craft. There was eager anxiety for the prize. The task was a rough one, but the reward of success was worth having. Seven or eight fishermen, among the most vigorous of the island, presented themselves. One by one they essayed, but not one could succeed in reaching Erm. The last one who tried his skill was known for having crossed, in a rowing boat, the terrible narrow sea between Sark and Breck U. Sweating with his exertions, he brought back the sloop and said, "'It is impossible!' Gilliatt then entered the bark, seized first of all the oar, then the mainsail, and pushed out to sea. 
Then, without either making fast the boom, which would have been imprudent, or letting it go, which kept the sail under his direction, and leaving the boom to move with the wind without drifting, he held the tiller with his left hand. In three quarters of an hour he was at home. Three hours later, although a strong breeze had sprung up and was blowing across the roads, the sloop, guided by Gilliatt, returned to saint Sampson with its load of stones. He had, with an extravagant display of his resources, even added to the cargo the little bronze cannon at Urm, which the people were in the habit of firing off on the 5th of November, by way of rejoicing over the death of Guy Fawkes. Guy Fawkes, by the way, had been dead two hundred and sixty years, a remarkably long period of rejoicing. Gilliatt, thus burdened and encumbered, although he had the Guy Fawkes Day cannon in the boat and the south wind in his sails, steered, or rather brought back, the heavy craft to saint Sampson. Seeing which, Mess Lettieri exclaimed, "'There's a bold sailor for you!' And he held out his hand to Gilliatt. We shall have occasion to speak again of Mess Lettieri. The sloop was awarded to Gilliatt. This adventure detracted nothing from his evil reputation. Several persons declared that the feat was not at all astonishing, for that Gilliatt had concealed in the boat a branch of wild meddler, but this could not be proved. From that day forward, Gilliatt navigated no boat except the old sloop. In this heavy craft he went on his fishing avocation. He kept it at anchor in the excellent little shelter which he had all to himself, under the very wall of his house of the Bou de la Rue. At nightfall he cast his nets over his shoulder, traversed his little garden, climbed over the parapet of dry stone, stepped lightly from rock to rock, and, jumping into the sloop, pushed out to sea. He brought home heavy takes of fish, but people said that his meddler branch was always hanging up in the boat. No one had ever seen this branch, but every one believed in its existence. When he had more fish than he wanted, he did not sell it, but gave it away. The poor people took his gift, but were little grateful, for they knew the secret of his meddler branch. Such devices cannot be permitted. It is unlawful to trick the sea out of its treasures. He was a fisherman, but he was something else. He had, by instinct or for amusement, acquired a knowledge of three or four trades. He was a carpenter, worker in iron, wheelwright, boat corker, and, to some extent, an engineer. No one could mend a broken wheel better than he could. He manufactured, in a fashion of his own, all the things which fishermen use. In a corner of the Bou de la Rue he had a small forge and an anvil, and the sloop having but one anchor, he had succeeded, without help, in making another. The anchor was excellent, the ring had the necessary strength, and Gilliatt, although entirely uninstructed in this branch of the smith's art, had found the exact dimensions of the stock for preventing the overbalancing of the fluke ends. He had patiently replaced all the nails in the planks by rivets, which rendered rust in the holes impossible. In this way he had much improved the sea-going qualities of the sloop. He employed it sometimes, when he took a fancy to spend a month or two in some solitary islet, like Chusi or the Casquet. People remarked, "'Aye, aye, Gilead is away!' But this was a circumstance which nobody regretted.' 